We've gone across the road. We're in section two of the cemetery. There's three, uh, three huge sections here in Whittier, California. All three are just beautiful. We're at the grave location of an actress that started out in 1938. Uh, she's way at the top. I can't zoom up there, it's just too blurry. But Gladys Hewlett starts out in 1908 in the movie or the film Romeo and Juliet. She also uh, makes an appearance in the Smoke Fairy. I just found online the silent movie, The Smoke Fairy. Uh, this is Gladys when she's 13 years old. This movie was released in 1909. He busts a bottle, lets loose the smoke fairy. Watch this. She'll shoot him the moon. Boom! Shot him the moon. He's trying to smoke her out. 1909 technology, by golly. <laughs> Here he teases her with the match. Interesting film. Okay, back to the video. She's active from 19, uh, 1908 through Now we're going to go way back a ways. We're going to come up and visit the uh, niche of an uh, actress that was active back in the 30s and uh, through the 40s. Uh, Mary Gordon, she's known primarily as a housekeeper in her Sherlock Holmes films, the mystery films. She, she does several movies. She's in Muni and the Bounty, The Bride of Frankenstein, and I remember her in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. This is back in 1939. Liz from 1882 until 1963. Look at here, some goofball left their video camera in the middle of the walkway. Up next is an NBA basketball player for the Lakers, Walt Hazard. He played for the UCLA Bruins with uh, John Wooden. He's co-captain of the 1964 team. He's drafted in the first round by the Lakers. When he graduated college, he became a Muslim, Abdul Rahman. However, when he played uh, professionally, he kept the name Walt Hazard. After his uh, basketball playing days, he goes on to become the coach of the UCLA Bruins in the mid 80s. He dies from complications of heart surgery, Walt Hazard. I remember him well. I'm finally getting smarter on this grave hunting business. Instead of walking up the hill, you can park at the top and walk down by golly. Much easier. <laughs> I'm at the unmarked grave of NFL player Lester Horner. Uh, Lester played in a day when there's no face mask. He plays for the Los Angeles Rams and the Dallas Texans. Yes, Dallas Texans before they were called the Cowboys. It was Paul Brown of the Cincinnati Bengals that invented the face mask. Uh, since I'm a Bengals fan, I'm going to tell you a little more about Paul Brown. Uh, it was his idea to put the microphone in a quarterback's helmet for play calling. Also, Paul Brown hired full-time assistant coaches. 
it was Paul Brown to um, to have the players uh, also would spend some time in a classroom setting uh, studying film and their playbook. I'll throw this in too. Paul Brown invented or founded the Cleveland Browns. That's how they got their name. And also the Cincinnati Bengals. In 1966, they finally get the franchise. And actually, their first season was 1968, I believe. Okay. You know. <laughs> You, you know, I guess I still got some uphill climbing after all. So here we go. Baseball fans will instantly recognize our next stop, Tommy Lasorda. Sorry about the shadow. Uh, Tommy Lasorda was the manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers and used to just irritate me to death since I'm a Reds fan. Uh, Tommy Lasorda's teams uh, seems like they always won. They did very well. He ends up in the uh, Major League Hall of Fame as a manager, but when he was 17 years old, he signs a $500,000 contract as a Southpaw pitcher when he was 17 years old. Now, that was a wheelbarrow full of money back then. That's a whole lot of dough. His son's buried right next to him, Spunky, Tommy Lasorda Jr. Looks like his wife Joan is buried here as well. Tommy Lasorda. I remember the Slim Fast commercials. In fact, I got on Slim Fast back then. What was it? Uh, late uh, was a late '80s, early '90s Slim Fast fad. I believe we're at the next location, but it can be a challenge, as you can see. Some of these headstones are. Uh, covered with dirt, grass, so on. So it takes lots of uh, walking around hunting for them. I think this is Elizabeth Flournay, who I'm looking for. And I see the 1977. I think this is her last name. So let's wipe it off a little bit and see if this is her. Ah. Oh boy. Yes, this is her. She's an actress. She appears in uh, oh, about 10 movies or so. Not real known, but I wanted to stop by and pay her my respects. Uh, she appears in uh, Kelly and Me, uh, that movie, Adam's Rib. I think I read where she was in Jet Pilot 2. Um, these movies did well, but weren't blockbusters. She usually plays a minor role, like a sales girl or a receptionist office type atmosphere. Hey, there's Slender Man right there <laughs> our next stop is the son of a Hollywood actress uh, this individual is six foot four handsome he played the part of a sidekick in the television series Perry Mason that ran from 1957 through 1966 he played the part of Paul Drake William Hopper sadly it looks like his uh, stone is starting to deteriorate he lived from 1915 until 1970. Uh, Perry Mason was a popular, very popular television series that did very well. Rated number one for a few years. William Hopper. He 
if you look way out there you can see the skyline of Los Angeles we're still in Whittier California this is a breathtaking view we're at the grave location of Hang Noor He's got quite a story, so I'll go ahead and tell it to you. He's in Cambodia. He and his wife are rounded up by the uh, communist regime and taken prisoner. He, had, he hid the fact that he was a doctor and a gynecologist because if you had an education then, uh, most likely you'd be killed. So it hides this fact. Uh, while they're incarcerated, his wife dies giving birth and the guards uh, wouldn't help or wouldn't give her AIDS. So you can imagine he's a doctor, gynecologist and this happens. Had to be very, very, very difficult. Ends up, he makes his way to the United States, comes out west, he's out here in Los Angeles. When uh, uh, somehow he's cast to do the movie The Killing Fields and he promised his wife he would tell the story of Cambodia, which he does. Now what's really cool is he wins Best Supporting Actor an Academy Award for that movie. So that, that's really cool. Man, that, that's really heartwarming. As he promised his wife, he would tell the story. Also has a sad ending. He's in Chinatown here in Los Angeles, just walking down the street when he's shot in the chest by three punks. Sad. It just doesn't make sense story near and dear to me. I knew Hang Noor growing up. My parents are also genocide survivors and he was a close family friend. I love him like my brother and I do anything for him. A refugee who faced and endured atrocities for years, yet with no acting experience, he became a Hollywood star seemingly overnight. The winner is Hang S. Noor in the killing this is Dr. Hang S. Noor, the first Asian male to win an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for 1984's The Killing Fields, where life truly imitated art. If the war keeps going like this, the future could be very bad. A role so raw and real, the physician turned actor could only watch it once. We're so proud of him, but I was a little bit envious of him too. <laughs> He was so famous. In reality, Noor survived the Cambodian killing fields. He was a doctor before the Khmer Rouge forced him and millions of others into labor camps where he was tortured and watched his wife die in his arms. After four years, the Khmer Rouge fell and Noor fled to the U.S. as a refugee. He became a social worker in Chinatown and was discovered by a casting director at a wedding. He became well known, not just for his acting, before his outspoken voice. They were killing doctors and professional people. Any kind or you are educated people or you were. Anybody educated. Yeah, mm. let's kill you. He took that Oscar almost like a weapon and said, okay, people want to see this Oscar, but you also going to get to hear what I have to say about what's going on in Cambodia. Arthur Dong, a filmmaker and professor at Loyola Marymount University, documented Dr. Noor's life in the killing fields of Dr. Hang S. Noor. He traveled the the whole world just speaking out because no one was at that time. Uh, he was so he was a real pioneer in getting the word out and advocating for justice in Cambodia. But this story does not have a Hollywood or happy ending. In February 1996, Dr. Noor's life cut short, shot and killed outside his modest apartment in Chinatown. Right, police are investigating the murder of Hong Noor. Police call it a robbery gone wrong. Three gang members convicted. Still today, a theory among the Cambodian community. It was an assassination. The notion of revenge is often brought up. The notion of an assassination that was planned by Pol Pot. In Long Beach, where there's a large Cambodian-American population, his legacy is celebrated. In this country, you could dream and you could want to 
have a voice and you could, and you could be on a stage like that. I think that's what he represented. He's the one who opened doors to many Asian Americans, especially Cambodian American in those fields. And with more than a dozen movies on screen and off, Dr. Heng S. Noor is sure never to be forgotten. He put us on the map. I think if you look at Dr. Noor's life, you see a survivor. I mean, to have gone from middle-class family to devastation and torture and escaping to America and making it in America and then winning an Oscar. It's incredible. A true American story that is. Sergeant. So I had to stop by and pay my respects, tell his story. So thanks for uh, thanks for clicking on this video and watching this part of it.